All right, well, thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about DAS interface options uh, when you're working with in, either an indoor uh, in-building DAS system or an ODAS. Uh, most, on most occasions with those types of installs, you're going to need to do some conditioning of the, the RF signal before you're applying it to the fiber DAS. Um, first, we're going to talk about some passive DIU options. And some of the stuff that we talk about during the passes also applies to the, the active. Uh, so what we'll, we'll do is, we'll, you know, we'll discuss those. Some of the decisions that you make are going to be uh, based on the same criteria. Um, a passive solution these days is probably more likely uh, necessary in a small to medium size application uh, where you have maybe one to three sectors. Um, if you have multiple bands and you know, three sectors, MIMO, you might consider going to an active, really depending on what type of space you have, what, if you have power, and what type of uh, environment that they're going to be installed in. The uh, retail stores, any type of a, uh, like a carrier branded store or, uh, you know, a big box store that has one of these systems in it, uh, if they're being fed by uh, a mix of RF sources, uh, conditioning is going to be necessary. So. Uh, some of the DASs have the conditioning built into it. Uh, the one that we launch is going to, some of the existing ones do, so you may not need to have a separate interface. Um, the old way of doing things was to, to plug together a bunch of attenuators and splitters and taps so that you could uh, monitor what you were doing with the fixed attenuation. Uh, any type of a, a DAS conditioner, whether it's active or passive, is going to give you uh, that option typically in either a mechanical or an electromechanical a variable attenuator. Some of the things that we ask uh, in trying to determine what, what's the best fit going to be, whether it's configuring the actual passive DAS tray or configuring <clears throat> the points of interface that are going into a, uh, an active tray, is how many sectors do you have? And when we ask that question, we've got to be clear about what the expectation of, of, of the sector is. Is the sector um, you know, uh, being confused with zones uh, in, in, in the actual deployment area, uh, or is it just the head end? And, and generally, when I refer to a sector, I'm talking about how many base station radios do you have, and how many different bands do you have? Um, so the number of sectors versus the number of zones in the DAS uh, coverage area is something that we need to, need to learn so that we can determine what best uh, DIU or active tray to uh, configure for your application. Maximum input power, um, one of the biggest things that you run into in these situations that require these is, is that you have a lot of power that needs to be conditioned way down to be able to apply it to a DAS. Um, with that attenuation comes some heat and environmental concerns come into play, so that's something that you know we'll typically ask and able to help you come up with the best configuration. What input level does a DAS require? You know, there's a link budget involved in this, just like any other system, so you've got to determine how much power you're going to come into the tray at, how much power you come out at, and then how much you need at the other end of that, that, that run that goes over to the fiber DAS. And then, obviously, location of the BTS equipment, that's going to tell you what, what your cable lengths are, and we'll probably ask what type of cable, and generally ask for link budget information. Type of rack and, uh, and how it's going to be mounted. You know, in some cases, the passive trays, uh, depending if it's a, a two-post rack and you've got a flush mount it, we'll probably have you stack a few of them on top of a, a support shelf. Um, same with the active tray, depending on how you're going to install them. The configuration, uh, some, some folks prefer to just have one, one or two part numbers and then they can, you know, sometimes they use all the ports, sometimes they don't, but they know they have a, um, a, a single part number to refer to. Uh, other folks like it. You know, the, the have it your way, uh, way, and that, that that's something that we did rather successfully with the passive trays. We would build it exactly with what you needed, and so you didn't you weren't paying for unused components and ports and and those sorts of things. We do have some market specific variants, so you know if Market X likes N outputs, uh, we'll build them with N. That was the most common uh, application, <clears throat> excuse me, configuration. And then certain markets would like QMA or SMA, uh, and that applies to the inputs, the outputs, the test ports, and so on. Um, a few markets have duplex to duplex. Uh, if you're doing a passive DAS or even a, a, some of the fiber trays that ask for a duplex input, we were able to do that. Um, 
it's an extra step, there's a little bit more loss involved with that, but generally that's all figured into the configuration process. Uh, MISO, which is you know, a multiple input but a single output, where we do some combining. Um, and also SIMO, where it's a single input that you can break out into multiple uh, uh, zones. I'm sure that was, some, <laughs> that was somebody else. Um, here's a, a pretty typical uh, front and rear panel of a, this is a four path tray that we designed. Very, very common. This would typically be either four paths of, of a, a, a given band. Uh, which would be two MIMO sectors, or it could be one MIMO sector of two different bands. It could also be, also be four SISO sectors of any given number of bands or combination of bands. Uh, very, very popular tray. Uh, this is a uh, block diagram of a single uh, MIMO sector or two SISO sectors. This is just a, you know, your duplex or your fixed attenuator, variable attenuator. This is your downlink path. Um, a directional coupler with a, uh, an output for a test port and then you've got on your uplink path you've got that same directional coupler uh, for your test port, a variable attenuator and your output back to the BTS. Um, in that four path tray this would be uh, look, that would look like this and again we, we can do either one of these in a 2U tray. Uh, for the four path we've got to use the assemblers with the little hands because it gets a little busy in there but uh, generally speaking that's um, Again, this is a very, very common template, and this template could be any number of bands or mixture of bands. So uh, this particular one happens to be a, 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 a two-sector MIMO 700 tray, but it could be a, a 700, 850, 1900 AWS SISO tray. Uh, it could be 700 AWS MIMO, uh, and so on. Uh, we took that uh, two-path design and went a step further uh, for the retail store environment. Uh, even though those two U-trays can be mounted to the wall, uh, there was a customer in, in one of the markets that wanted something that was a little bit more wall friendly. So we, we came up with this design, which is two paths. It can be for low power or high power. And all your attenuation is right on the front. So this sits on the wall just like this. You get cable coming in uh, and that's it. You walk away. Make your, your uh, <clears throat> set your attenuation and, uh, and go. We had some uh, non-contiguous inputs and duplex to duplex. So if you have like two paths of non-contiguous PCS band and you want to combine them onto one, one path that you want to condition, come out as a single combined output, you can do that here. Um, we can do that either coming out simplex, which would just come right out there, or we can reduplex that signal uh, if it's a passive DAS and you want to come out duplex. And then the MISO and MIMO option, this is basically gives you an option of coming out. You terminate the MIMO ports uh, when you want to come out with a, with a single output, and then you terminate the single output when you want to come out MIMO. This allows you to be, uh, you know, MISO today, but MIMO tomorrow if somebody, if they add the, uh, the additional resources on the DAS to support MIMO. <clears throat> and then custom configurations where we can come in with, you know, take a single path and give you multiple uh, zone outputs that you can condition independently and we can do that on you know with multiple bands the box tends to grow as we do this we built it built all that zone management into the tr into the tray so it can go to three or four U. Uh, but again something that we'll do based on your requirements uh, we'll work with you and then this is something that you can come you can use with any existing system if you've got an existing system today that that's growing, uh, you're growing the number of zones and you need to start splitting either, you know, you've got a SISO, uh, excuse me, a uh, simplex output going to uh, two different zones or up to, you know, three zones, maybe a four zone, whatever you need to do, this is just something that we can build custom for you to fit your application. So that was passive trays. We'll talk a little bit now about the active trays. Um, if you like the uh, ability to do some, uh, uh, well, first of all, Typical application spots, public venues, anything, any large stadium, campus mass transit, this is the places that are, that are buying unit. Um, again, key features and benefits are that you have, um, first of all, you can come into these at a, up to about 100 watts, which is uh, 50 dBm, or all the way down to zero dBm. So um, this particular product has the lowest loss in the industry as far as uh, loss between the input and the output in high power mode, it's, it's about 14 dB of loss. And in low power mode, it's only about five maximum. So it's between three and five 
uh, in low power mode. And you can come into this in low power mode as high as 40 dBm, uh, which is key. The uh, remote user interface, uh, everything is it uh, can be monitored in, uh, independently, alarms, it can works via SNMP. You can use um, you know, a direct connect, you can log into it locally or remotely through any type of a gateway, modem is, is pretty typical. And uh, we give you power measurements for, for uplink and downlink on every single point of interface. You can daisy chain the unit, you can also independently assign IP addresses so that you can have, you know, use port forwarding with a router or switch. And uh, in addition to that, we support every currently deployed band. Uh, WCS is right around the corner. Um, just to recap, the flexibility of the unit, first of all, it has the 12 slots. You can combine SISO and MIMO sectors within the chassis. Um, a MIMO sector would take up two slots. SISO is going to take up one. Uh, we also have a, uh, a splitter combiner. And there's a spectrum analyzer, uh, a scanning receiver built into the uplink path that allows you to look at the noise floor when you're commissioning. Um, before anybody's using the system, you can look and see if there's any uh, noise uh, rises on, on a particular zone or you know, in a particular remote location. The way that we in, uh, install these is, is all of the POIs are exactly the same, but they can be installed um, with the DIN connector down or the DIN connector up. And we alternate that because it makes it a whole lot simpler for you to, to, to cable this thing up. Uh, a lot of times you'll see a POI or a, a, a chassis for an active interface, all the POIs are stacked right next to each other. You can barely get two DIN connectors on there uh, when they're so close. So we stagger these, the, uh, the DIN connector is always down in the odd slots and it's always up in the, in the even slots. Um, the four-way combiner splitter can be used. Uh, if we come in here from a POI, we can split out to, up to four uh, four times. We can also come into uh, the splitter combiner up with up to four signals and have a combined output. So if you need capacity and you want to combine sectors, that's an option. And again, if you have non-contiguous uh, pass bands and you want to combine them to one output to the DAS, you can do that as well. Um, here you can see the, the, the uh, mixed orientation of the POIs. Uh, we do provide cable management. This gives you uh, the ability to just a Velcro or, or uh, lace, lace your, your cabling down. And you can see a, a pretty good example of, of uh, the suggested way of, of cabling. We understand that people are gonna have their own uh, preferential uh, cabling and, and tying down uh, procedures, but uh, this works pretty well. And if, uh, if anybody wants to see it, it's, it's at our booth as well. The um, high power jumper setting is in this orientation, you've got two if you want to switch it to low power, you just take one of those off and then move uh, the other one uh, into this orientation. And there's also a setting in the GUI that needs to be changed in the web interface. You tell it that it's going to be a low power signal. Again, you can come into all the way up to 50 dBm in high power max, or excuse me, high power uh, mode and 40 dBm in low power mode, which gives you, uh, again, that, that reduced insertion loss, which is great for any, any system that has a huge long run between the DAS interface and the, the fiber head end. Um, again, the combiner splitter allows you to either combine sectors and or split them out to multiple zones. And the web interface is very, very simple. It's, it's as easy as, as I've seen. Um, you can look at individual POIs. You look at the uplink and downlink individually. Uh, we actually have a, a, a new user interface that we're, we're looking at that's potentially a little even a little bit easier where you can see just everything on one page. Um, you can monitor the alarms, the fan status. Uh, we're compliant with all of the known uh, monitoring systems uh, that the carriers are currently using. And uh, again, the biggest benefit is that ability to remotely access the, uh, the, the, the com uh, conditioner and make changes on the fly. You don't necessarily have to roll a truck out to make a change if there's an issue. So it gives you a lot of flexibility um, without having to roll a truck. In the downlink page, you're able to change um, the configured attenuation. You can set your alarm thresholds for uh, input power. And you can also set a clamp down 
a level. And the clampdown level actually gives you, it's not ALC, so to speak, but it allows you to protect the DAS from, from being overdriven. And what that does, if you know that at 45 dBm of input power, you're gonna be overdriving your DAS, you can set that threshold to say 43 or 44, you'll get an, it'll, it'll, the system will automatically add in whatever available attenuation it has to prevent that, uh, that signal from overdriving your DAS. On the uplink page, uh, you can look at up to 15 different slices if you want to look at the, the power levels and you can, you can change these slices, you can use what the defaults are. 700 megahertz, you might only need five. Um, in, a, in a PCS environment, you might need to use all 15 or might want to see 15 different points of, of interest. And these data points are all here and it gives you the, the current input and output power uh, for each one of those slices. Uh, the alarm page, any typical alarm you can imagine, plus we, we give you uh, temperature and, and fan alarms. Uh, the, uh, they can all be downloaded in an in Excel file or CS, CSV format and exported into Excel. And also again, uh, compliant with all of the, the known uh, monitoring agents for, for the carriers. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right, well that's it. That's uh, the presentation on uh, DAS conditioning trays. Hope, uh, hope it was informative. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact uh, myself or anyone at Westel uh, in the in-building group. We'll be happy to help you.